Let's talk about the homework a little bit. First of all, um, you've got to get the files in the right place. You need your journal files to be in your journal folder. They also have to be on the Dropbox. If you leave them in the private area of the assignment, the <coughs> validator can't get to them without supplying a password. I can't, I can't do my little one-click validator. So put the files in the right places. For those of you who zip the files up, that's cool. Thank you very much. You'll find that if you drop an HTML file in the Dropbox, it strips out any of the active tags, <laughs> part of the security mechanism of Dropbox. So when you leave .html files in the Dropbox, you have to zip them. But that's why the course tells you to make it a .txt file and leave it in the Dropbox put a .html file in the um, I just put both on each. I put the files on the file, I put the HTML syntax, and Dropbox HTML. Excellent. If I find your HTML file on the server, and I can validate it there, and I can view the source there, that's what I'm looking for. If I find it in the Dropbox, that's great. That's what I'm looking for. If your JavaScript is gone missing in the HTML Dropbox, I completely understand why I did that. Usually I don't look at your HTML unless I'm looking for the specific thing I asked you to add this week or something's wrong. Because if something's wrong, I want to be able to see what's wrong and what's, what I can do to help. Yes, sir. It's like the Dropbox this week said to just drop the database assignment onto in the Dropbox and that was it. Everything else went on the student server. Do you still want everything else dropped in the Dropbox? In general, yes. But in any case, if you follow directions and you say, Al, it says right here. Just do it. That's like why I'm asking because that's what it said. Yeah, I got no complaints. Okay. Okay. My general rule is I need to see in both places. Okay. I need to understand. Okay. Now, if we turned it in as is by the date, uh -huh. but figured out how to fix some of it in the last couple of days, can we upload it and just change it, you know, put revised or something? Tell you where I stand on two sides of that issue. Two sides of that issue. One is on the server, the timestamp of your file is what tells the, the tale. If you put uh, journal journal a1.html in the folder, I look at the timestamp on that. If you go back around and you change that, then I'm just going. I, you know, I have a very short memory and a very small brain, and I just go, oh, she's late. If you turn it into the Dropbox, and this is another reason why you should put stuff in the Dropbox, I, it dates it, it timestamps it, I can comment on it, you can comment on it. If you come back around and say, oh, geez, I hope he hasn't graded this yet because I have time to uh, throw this in, then I can see that you threw another file. So in the Dropbox, yeah, throw anything you want in there. Any, get it in on time first. The whole deal's off if you miss the initial deadline. But on the server, it's a little harder. I don't really think, since you know, A3 and A4 are coming right on the thing, the, the discipline you've got to get into is release on time, because there's another release happening in two weeks. Just, just move forward. Having said that, by uh, the time you put JavaScript in your journal file, you had better make sure the whole thing is validated. If you think it's hard to validate a file with HTML and CSS in it, it's a pain in the butt to try and uh, validate it with JavaScript. So your file has to be rock solid before you put your JavaScript in. Wait, I think I have him. So if I didn't put certain files in the Dropbox, because it didn't say you can I go back into the note that? Yeah, no, you know it up. In any case, in every case, if you talk to me about what you're doing, You'll find I'm an amazingly, uh, well, I won't say I'm tall. I won't say I'm easy to get along with. I'm hearing the voice of my wife in my head. Um, but talking to me is better than not talking to me. If you don't talk to me, I got no idea what you're thinking. If you tell me, look, like uh, Kay said, I really want to do HTML5. I said, no, I don't want to do HTML5. So I really want to do HTML5, and it's compatible, and I, and I fulfill the assignment, and blah, 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 I get a great case for it. So fine, 
right, that's how we're doing it. If you tell me, oh, my dog died three weeks after you didn't turn something in, eh. Sorry. Okay. Sometimes it's hard to figure out what the heck I'm going to do next. So, ask me. Yes. So, um, on the journal that we had on week two assignment, yeah. the um, version that we had before we updated this latest version, uh -huh. I do have both text and the HTML on my hard drive, but I went ahead and put the HTML version in the Dropbox. Now, did you, say you put you it on the server too? Yes. Good but, but see, the server now has the update. Well, no, it's still has the update. Yes, because so, you're renaming it each time. We don't use version control in this. We use version naming in this. So the Dropbox, what exactly will be missing from that HTML? Okay, let's, let me back up and tell you why I do it the way I do it. Care. It has to be on the server for two reasons. One, you need to work with servers. You need to figure out how to work with servers. You need to get comfortable with working with servers. Two, it lets me serve it as a web page and validate it and send it around the world and look at it. Okay, so that's why it's on the server. Why are we doing the Dropbox? For a record of this class. For a record of me being able to grade you and comment and, and you being able to respond and you being able to leave me notes. So the Dropbox is the primary conduit of conversation between you and me in terms of assignments and that sort of stuff. We also use the server. Now why do I go, you gotta name it exactly this, and you gotta name it this, and you gotta put it here, and you gotta put it here? That's just because those are detail orientation kind of skills you need to have. It's really the kind of stuff that will pay off when you are doing this kind of work in the real world. And they're gonna make you do it pretty much every other CIS class all the way along. Just and this is just CIS training for your and on the job. Anyway. And on the job, you know, frankly, um, the world is an incredibly detailed place. And you may not understand all the detail when it works, but you've got to understand all the detail when it fails and you're the guy who's responsible for it. Case in point, my client, <laughs> my lovely, intelligent, and rich client, who I'm building this website for cannot sign up for the latest prototype. Because the prototype sends out an email saying, welcome to blah, blah, blah. Click here to activate your account. My lovely and intelligent and pays for bills on time client still uses AOL. Still uses AOL. That activation email is lost. It's lost. So I had to learn how to rail send AOL email. I have to learn I'm using a service provider called SendGrid because I'm going to be sending them billions of pieces of email. I had to learn how they work. I was on the phone with these support people today. I had to learn there's this thing called whitelisting where you can get things. Did you know you have to warm up an IP address before you start sending email from it? If you start sending a lot of email from an IP address, especially to places like uh, Yahoo and Gmail, they're like, whoa, spam king, and they shut you off. Right. Now, all of this I knew something about. Today I knew it in great depth. And I still have not found that bank email. Yet. Does the client care? No. No. And I am never going to try and explain it to her. The technical parts don't matter to customers. They matter to me because I am standing in for computers. I am the embodiment of computers. Computers care about the details. And they won't work at all unless you get it straight. Blah, 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 blah. That's the last time I'm going to say that today. <laughs> the next thing about uh, the homework is some folks had uh, turned in file names over file name dot extension dot extension. So an extension is a three letter uh, uh, part of the file name. It's things like doc or these days doc. Now most modern file systems have no problem with lots of dots in the middle of file names. So this is really something that will help you only when you're dealing with more primitive file systems. But you've got to have only one of these. If you turn in something that says uh, assignment blah 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 dot doc x, the doc x, I'm going to take points away. <coughs> 
how did this usually arise? It usually arises because you've got your computer set up to hide extensions from you. And so when you when you save something, you don't actually see what it's saved. So you type it in. Pardon me? So people type it in. Yep. Sometimes the computer is smart enough to add it for you, sometimes it's not. Bottom line here, the thing I'd like you to, to do, the recommendation I have for you is go into Windows or go into the OS X or whatever operating system you use, <coughs> turn on extensions. See what you're doing. But you might also want to turn on system and hidden folders as well. It'll uh, just tell the computer, I want to see everything. Yes, it's confusing. Yes, it's annoying when you first run into that environment. But you guys are in the, the business of understanding what you're doing when it comes to computers. So if you haven't already, um, turn on, make extensions visible so you don't <laughs> run into this sort of thing. Not everybody's running into this, but a couple people do every quarter. I just wanted to bring that up. How do you turn on the extensions in the computer? In the, uh, in the, on a Mac, you go into the Finder preferences, and you say, I want to see uh, everything. I want to see hidden file names. I want to see extensions. Uh, Windows 7, it's in uh, it's, uh, File Explorer preferences. Hit yeah, Alt, bring up the menu, go to Tools, go to Folder Options, select View. Wait, so what happened? Then you can go to the Control Panel. Go into the Control Panel and then type up in the search button up in the very top. Right? Type yep. in the extension. One of the options is Show or Hide File Extensions. Hold on. There you go. Okay. And then that's, that's the same uh, folder as a hidden. Yeah, it shows. Like and then you can choose Yeah. So show hidden files and folders. And then there's an extension. I always do this too. And uncheck hide extensions. extensions. Where is that? It's down. There we go. And I would say run with scissors. Yes, and, I know. And do what? Run with scissors. Oh. <laughs> Watch. I'm not saying mess with your operating system. I'm saying observe your computer in detail. So, um, that's that thing. What was the other, what was the other thing that I noticed? Oh, the Emily Smith problem. That made me like go back and have to change things about assignment one. That, that really, really was not happening. I'm sorry about that. All right, so some of you folks noticed um, that in our data, and this is, okay, so we're going to stop talking about the details of the homework. Now we're going to move into databases. We're going to start talking about databases. Because the problem was, it was an Emily Smith. Yeah. Emily Smith, for whatever reason, has a different last name than any of the other people who live with her. The issue here is, what's a family? You remember in assignment one, we had to come up with a schema that had a person belongs to a family. A person works at a company, right? Three tables, four keys. Um, there was a PIM1.xls, uh, an early version of the spreadsheet that was poorly designed. And if you looked in your materials that talked about the problems in having multiple columns for additional children and things like that. So the first time this, this mythical client tried to come up with this works uh, worksheet, they had all these extra columns. Then they made a new worksheet called PIM2, where they broke it out so that every person was on a row by themselves. And that was one of the steps that our mythical <coughs> client took to start to make the data more understandable, to make the data more workable. Now what happened when they did that is they started taking some of the information and putting it in different columns. Some folks here noticed that they didn't name the columns very well. And that's not a bug. It's not a bug in the, it's not a bug in the course materials. That's human nature. People get, people are messy. The second thing that happened is it became confusing about who is Emily Smith because she's in the same address as what is it, the Cartman family? 
don't know why someone was named their child with a different last name, but that's not my problem. I'm a business analyst. I have to understand how they want to work. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, in human society, families are really strange and different things. I don't know how many different kinds of families there are. If you've ever looked carefully, uh, who took the 2010 census? So some people shot the guy when he came to your door. That's it. Thank you. Thank you for being American. That's what we do. If you look at that form, they're doing an amazing job of trying to define who lives in this house. And back in the 60s, when I first started paying attention to this, they used to call people who lived in a house a family. And that's just not true. So as business analysts, our challenge is, how do we, how do we understand this situation? And what do we do? So if you remember, there was a family table. There was a person table. And there was a company table. And the hint that they gave you had the last name in the family table. Because what the first whack, you look at that, and people, everybody who lives in the same house, boy, most of them seem to have the last name. So instead of storing last name on for every person, they have the first name, you think, well, maybe I can factor that out. And I can leave that over here. But that's something that pertains to the family. Just like address, since most of the families in that data set all live at the same address. So you can take where the person happens to live and you can put it over there. It saves on storage, it makes things simpler. But Emily Smith messes this up. Now with Emily Smith, and I think this was discussed in the, in the discussion forum, where, what do we do with Emily Smith? So there were a couple of different ideas that came up. <coughs> One is you, you don't put the last name the family, you put it in the person. And that, in fact, is the simplest thing to do. That's the simplest thing to do. Um, there were some other suggestions about, well, you could set it up so that I could look here and then I could look here. And that's an interesting thing. What we're going to talk about today is, remember the system development life cycle? The system development life cycle is do analysis first, analysis, then you do the design. The design second. Actually, there are phases two and three. You didn't necessarily encounter that problem every time, though, because you only had to pick eight uh, profiles on that Excel sheet, or eight different rows. That was my question, too, is that some of us, because we knew it was an issue, could skip and just not add her because we didn't have to add everybody in the data set. Well, I'll tell you, in terms of grades, if you're concerned about grades, either one of these works for me. The main thing for me was to see how many people said, wait a minute, first of all, the suggestion you gave me doesn't work. I love when a student says, you gave me something that doesn't work. The pressure on you to believe that what I give you is true is enormous, especially in schools. You, what the teacher says has that aroma of truth and, and correctness around it. you got to get that out of your head. Just because I'm up here and you're down there, you know, I'm any better than this than you are. I just happen to have done it before you did. So that's the first thing. Is to take something from me and say, you know, this doesn't work because this, this, and this. <coughs> the second thing is for you to actually take a look at the names to actually think about how is this data working? How does this data work? That's the essential, essential uh, mode of thought that you have to do. Um, addresses, the home address. You could put all of this data in one table. In fact, that's what it is. That's the spreadsheet. It's one big table, and every row is a person, and everything I know about that person is in that row. The reason we're having you move it out to these tables is we're having to take the stuff that's common from person to person and put it in, in its own table. That way, instead of storing the same address for all six members of the Cartman family, I only store it once. Now, it doesn't really seem significant when we're just talking about a little address book, but when you're storing millions of little pieces of information about millions of people, believe me, it takes up a lot of space and it really takes a lot of time. 
So this is a tiny little example where we start to learn some of these more general principles. Similarly, there are things that a person does in a context at a company that is more about the company than it is about the people. So things like the, your, your, where the company address is. That's true for everybody who works at that particular office. Some things associated with the company aren't true for everyone in that company. Your personal work email, that's only true for you. So some people put work email here. I wouldn't. I put it over here. Because the personal, the work email, just like nobody else at BCC has your BCC email, email is one of those things that's one per customer. One and only one email, well, one email per customer. Okay, so that was the process for address for going through um, assignment number one. Uh, some folks, you did it fine, you didn't do it the way I wanted it, or I would have, but it was, you had done the right thought processes, you turned something in, it's all good. Um, some people just went a little, it was just a little bit too much, and I haven't finished with everybody. But most folks where I said, no, we're not done here yet, I kicked it back to you and said, no, let's try this again, and I want to talk to you about it. The important thing about this business of organizing information is it's not simple. It isn't simple. The whole thing about names. Um, I don't know how many names, who still has a grandma who's, who's living? When you want to be affectionate, what do you call her? What's that? What do you, what's your name for grandma? Grandma. Okay, well, Frankie Old Bag. Has a blood grandmother. Grandmother. What's your name for grandma? Frankie Old Bag. Frankie Old Bag. <laughs> she, she hits me. I, I presume that's with underscores, so that there are no spaces. <laughs> You can see there's a lot of different names for the same thing. That same concept of grandma. The woman who was one of your parents' mother. Okay, so the concept is, is very narrow and easily defined. Sometimes. I've known people who have called, who have treated another woman as grandma who weren't genetically related to her at all. But she did the grandma thing for them. And as far as they're concerned, she's their grandma. The point here I'm saying is that, okay, when you interview a client and you say, what's the name of this thing? And some will say Nana, and some will say Grandmother, and some will say, Frank, you all do? Okay, what do you Bat. Bat. I was afraid of the other B word. Frank, you old bat. You'll get a whole bunch of names. <laughs> it's a term of here. Yeah, I'm sure it is. <laughs> and uh, your job as an analyst is to accept them all. So, okay, sometimes it's bad, sometimes it's, uh, sometimes it's grandma, sometimes it's grandma. In the analysis phase, you accept all those different names. In the design phase, you don't have that freedom. Internal to your software, you have to name one thing with one name. You can't name the same thing two different ways in two different parts of your, of your system. Your system doesn't know the difference. You can have aliases. So if we call this woman grandma, grandma, uh, grand, probably we we'll call her grandmother. Now I could say in other places that nana is equivalent to grandma. In my database, sooner or later, I have to choose one name for this entity. And then I'm going to even go further, and I'm going to have naming conventions where entities are all caps, tables, where they have to be plural. The naming conventions get very strict. But in the beginning, in the analysis part of things, whenever someone says, oh, this is my name for it, you write it down, you, you deal with it. So that was why assignment one is kind of sloppy. At least that's the rationale for that. It may be that the guy who wrote the, the assignment just wasn't very careful, but that's human too. So today we're going to get really tight and really careful about names. And during today's lecture, we're actually going to use a piece of PowerPoint. And after all of that noise that I gave you last 
week about what PowerPoint should look like. I'm going to show you a horrible PowerPoint. Just a horrible PowerPoint. And more than that, I am going to challenge each and every one of you to stay awake during this PowerPoint. I'm, I'm serious. So let's uh, take a three minute break. Three minute break. break. Gird ourselves for this ordeal that we're about to run the gauntlet of database terminology and delight. <laughs>